It started with a book, a book that should have been just a blip in history. But the graphic and sensational stories within the book would lead to nearly two decades of paranoia. It would lead to thousands of traumatized children, people sent to prison for crimes they didn't commit, and everything in pop culture being scrutinized, with the media all too willing to help spread this panic. A panic that cults of satanic worshippers have infiltrated every part of society. It sounds familiar, but this isn't Pizzagate or QAnon. This is the satanic panic. While the satanic panic did start with a book called Michelle Remembers, it was bound to happen. You can go back in the history books and plot the path to this event happening. First, let's start with the 60s, a time of counterculture, where the works of Anton LaVey were published. Anton LaVey pretty much rallied against the church by creating the Church of Satan, which his satanic church was less about religion and more about giving the middle finger to all religions. To him, Satan was more of a figurehead. His Church of Satan was atheist. To him, Satan was the poster child for rebellion and freedom from oppression. And well, though not really looked at seriously, it did give some of the more conservative members of our society a boogeyman to point the finger at. Also in the 1960s, counterculture came under fire thanks to the Manson murders. And I will probably do a full video on Charles Manson and the Manson family at some point. But for now, let's say the crime scenes involved painting words on walls in blood and the whole helter-skelter thing. Rosemary's Baby also came out in the late 1960s, followed by The Exorcist and The Omen in the 70s. These three films are pretty good, but these films also made some conservative Christian leaders think that Hollywood was glorifying the devil. In fact, fundamentalist Christian leaders felt that Satan was beginning to infiltrate the media. More about that in part three. I know, it's a long way, but I have other projects to do. I digress. In the 1970s, you have The Son of Sam, a series of murders that happened in the Bronx and Queens in 1976 and 1977. David Berkowitz claimed that the reason that he killed nine people and wounded six was because his neighbor's dog was compelling him to, and his neighbor's dog was possessed by a demon. He would later claim that in 1979 that he had joined a satanic cult in 1975. For reference, this was all made up. Berkowitz had a habit of making up reasons for why he did the things he did just to mess with others. His real reason for his crimes, he later said, was because he hated women. Finally, the last person I want to talk about is Mike Warnke. The Lord hung on a cross and shed his blood to wash my sins away, and that's why I'm a Christian, amen? And when the Lord decided to save me, he didn't need your permission. You know that? And when the Lord decided to call me, he called me so that I could use my talents for him. Now, I don't sing, I don't play the piano, I don't dance. I am not a great orator. I am not a pulpit preacher. There is only one talent I have. I am weird. <laughs> Who had more of a presence in the 1980s due to the satanic panic. But in 1972, he published The Satan Seller, a book of lies. You see, Mike Warnke was just a regular dude who just wanted people to appreciate him. So he made up this whole entire story about how he was in a satanic cult when he was younger before he became Christian. This book includes orgies, alcoholism, drug dealing, Warnke stating that he was a high priest of Satan, sacrifices of animals and children, kidnapping, essays, and Warnke's real life time in Vietnam. But the stories of his heroism in Vietnam is highly exaggerated. He was in Vietnam for only six months and was wounded. How he was wounded is up for debate, but he was wounded and sent home. This dude is still alive today, and though his book has been overly debunked, he still talks about this stuff as if it was fact. And I'm not gonna go into this book, but here is a reason why he is on here. He claimed before he went to Vietnam in 1969, he met Charles Manson at a satanic ritual. And this story is completely false. It has been thoroughly proven that these two have never met. Now I am hoping I summarize all of this well enough because while all of this could have started the satanic panic, it didn't. The reason for this is no one ever heard the idea of satanic ritual abuse. Not till a psychiatrist from Canada and a patient wrote a book called Michelle Remembers in 1980.
Whenever I think of conspiracy theories featuring a satanic cult that has permeated society, I normally think of the land that I originate from, the United States. But this time, it is not the United States' fault. This started in Canada. The U.S. just made it worse. But this started in Victoria, British Columbia. Lawrence Pazder was a psychiatrist, and in 1973, he began to see a patient named Michelle Smith. Smith had suffered a miscarriage and was mentally not all there. In one session, she told Dr. Pazder that she wanted to tell him something, but she wasn't sure what it was. But she felt it was important. In another, she screamed for 25 minutes straight, and in another, she spoke as if she was a five-year-old girl. This all led to 14 months of the two having sessions that are implied in the book as hypnotherapy, where she would recall events that took place when she was five years old. According to these sessions, Smith's mother was a member of a satanic cult that had ritualistically abused Smith. The abuse was alleged to have taken place over the course of year. Then all of this was chronicled in the book Michelle Remembers, written by Dr. Pazder and Michelle Smith, published on November 1st, 1980. It became a best-selling novel and was a non-fiction book. But there is a problem. You see, publishers rarely fact-checked anything, and while Dr. Pazder probably had the best of intentions, it was all bunk. Michelle Smith's life was tragic, yes. She lost her parents at a young age and lived with her grandparents before she was sent to Catholic school. But was she a part of a satanic cult as a child? Well, the answer is no. You see, I'm not going to go much into detail about this book, the reason being that it was horrifying and if some of the events actually happened to a child, then the world should be outraged. But if you want to dive into it, there's a podcast called You're Wrong About that has a five-part series on it. I am not a book reviewer. I am a true crime YouTuber. I only deal in facts that have to do with a case while trying to keep monetized because the YouTube gods hate blood and gore. I will say, according to the book, this cult attached a devil's tail and wings to her body in a painful way that would have left scarring. And when no scars were discovered on her body, she claimed the Virgin Mary healed her scars. Oh, and also Dr. Pazder and Michelle Smith were married when the book came out. So it looks as though Dr. Pazder took advantage of his patient. And then the two got together and came up with these stories that are in this book in order to make money. But that's just my opinion. This book has been debunked, and though it was a huge best-selling novel at the time, it has not been reprinted since the 1990s. Because investigations into the claims presented in the book were thoroughly debunked. There was no satanic cult living in the area of Victoria, British Columbia at the time of Michelle Smith being a child. She was dealing with a miscarriage that had caused mental problems for her and she was treated with recovered memory therapy, which is a discredited form of therapy that usually involves a way to unlock forgotten memories, like hypnotherapy or other means. This is discredited because the mind is a very complex organ. What is fantasy and what is a memory in these techniques is pretty much very hard to determine. More often than not, the subject's mind is coming up with imaginary scenarios rather than remembering something forgotten. But this small book, which should have been a blip in history, caused a snowball effect. Adults began to come forward with allegations that they might have been abused in such ways. Soon the world was wondering if there was satanic cults hiding within every aspect of society. The idea of satanic ritual abuse became a part of national interest. Allegations of SRA would arise, with similar things that you see today with QAnon and Pizzagate. Here are a few examples. That the wealthy were breeding people into slavery for sacrifice, prostitution, and other horrible things. It sounds pretty familiar to the types of things you find in 4chan, right? Here is what is different. Social workers and police began to take these things highly seriously, to the point that police were told how to handle such investigations. Social workers working with children were trained how to handle cases of SRA. Prosecutors also got in on the panic, using the book Michelle Remembers as a guidebook to prepare cases. Because of this book, Lawrence Pazder would be a consultant on over a thousand cases of alleged SRAs. The Children's Institute International also fell into this panic. Starting in 1906, the CII was a non-profit abuse therapy clinic based in LA. One of their social workers was Key McFarlane, and she played an important role in the trial of a preschool, but not in a good way, because her methods almost put innocent people in prison. The McMartin Preschool was located on a beach, Manhattan Beach in California, which was a part of LA. One of the students at this small school was a boy named Billy Johnson. Billy was two and a half years old and his mother Judy wasn't the most stable of people. Judy Johnson was a paranoid schizophrenic, which no one knew at that time, but it came out later that her mental health was pretty bad. She was also obsessed with her son's bowel movements. Billy had trouble going to the bathroom, so every day before sending him to school, she would check his, well, butt. 
And when he came home, she would check his butt again as well. I'm not comfortable talking about butts, especially kids' butts, so please give me a pass on this one. She became convinced that her son had been abused by one of his teachers, a teacher named Ray Bucky, who was the grandson of the school's founder, Virginia McMartin, and the son of administrator at the school, Peggy McMartin Bucky. Here is Judy Johnson's reasons for thinking this. As stated, she checked Billy's butt every morning and when he came home from school. Well, when he would go to school, his um, rectum looked normal. But when he returned home, it was red. I feel sorry for the kid, his mother being that obsessive to look in his butt. But anyways, this somehow snowballed into wild accusations that Judy levied against McMartin School, which included teachers of the school participating in bestiality, that Peggy Bucky drilled a kid under the arm, and that Ray Bucky could fly. So stuff that the police should just call CPS about her son and get him in the care of someone less crazy and dismiss her claims. But stupidity alert, they didn't. Instead, they began to investigate Ray Bucky and sent a letter to over 200 parents who either sent their children to the school or were sending their children to the school. September 8th, 1983. Dear Parent, This department is conducting a criminal investigation involving Ray Bucky, an employee of Virginia McMartin's preschool, was arrested September 7th, 1983 by this department. The following procedure is obviously an unpleasant one, but to protect the rights of your children as well as the rights of the accused, this inquiry is necessary for a complete investigation. Records indicate your child has been or is currently a student at the preschool. We are asking your assistance in this continuing investigation. Please question your child to see if he or she has been a witness to any crime or or if he or she has been a victim. This was an excerpt of the letter sent to parents of children who were at the time enrolled into the preschool, or had in the past. Which to me, just my opinion, was highly irresponsible of the police to do so in this manner. The reason I say this is because what I left out from the letter I just read is a description of graphic crimes that Ray Bucky had been accused of doing. Oh, and they name him in the letter. Which they could have left it as they're investigating a teacher without naming him, and encourage anyone with information to come forward. But it was sent out and concerned parents began to look to their children and ask if anything happened to them. The majority of the time the answer was nothing happened, but parents still persisted and soon it got worse. The police decided that instead of them handling the children and interviewing them, they would instead hand the responsibility to the Children's Institute International to do the interviews with the children. 400 children were interviewed and all of them were done by one person, Key McFarlane. Not much is known about the life of Key McFarlane, just that she was born roughly around 1947, and that she worked for the CII. She considered herself a psychotherapist, though she did not have the qualifications to be one, and her lack of training in how to deal with children was shocking. For one, a typical interview between her and a child would start with the child claiming nothing happened, but then she would begin asking leading questions in order to get the answer she wanted. She would also tell the children that she interviewed that other children had come forwards and tell the child what the other children had come forward with. She would use anatomically correct dolls. Pretty much, she was the worst type of person to get answers about what was happening to these children from. Children naturally will answer what they feel an adult wants to hear. Children naturally want to feel accepted. This is why you do not ask them leading questions. Sometimes nothing actually happened, and it should be left at that. But Key McFarlane was one of those people who were engulfed with the idea that SRA was happening, and she wanted to do whatever it took to stop it, even if it wasn't happening. I should point out that she was a director at the CII, meaning she was a boss. I wanted to talk about her before going into what the children claimed happened because I wanted to paint a picture of how stupid she was. And trust me, in this next chapter, you're going to learn some things these children were telling her that she believed. Let's talk about some of the things the children claimed in these interviews with CII. In addition to claiming that the children were essayed, the children also claimed they were taken to underground tunnels for satanic rituals. The place didn't have underground tunnels. 
They claimed they saw witches fly, that they were taken up in a hot air balloon. They claimed orgies in car washes. They claimed that children were being flushed down toilets. And something called the Naked Movie Star, which was thought to be CP, but was actually a children's rhyme that was used to pick on other children. When shown pictures of people that could have possibly done things to kids in satanic rituals, some of the children pointed out a picture of Chuck Norris. Why was a picture of Chuck Norris among these images? That's just baffling. So yeah, there was enough here to prove these kids were making things up to make adults who were asking them questions happy. And that they have some very weird imaginations. Still, the police ended up taking this seriously and then began making arrests. Now, when I say they were taking it seriously, what I meant to say was they were taking the allegations of S.A. seriously, even if the interviews were coerced. On March 22, 1984, Ray Bucky, Virginia McMartin, Peggy McMartin Bucky, Ray's sister Peggy Ann, Marianne Jackson, Betty Rader, and Babette Spittler were arrested on 115 counts of S.A., which was then up to 321 counts of S.A. The pre-trials took a really long time to finish. It took 20 months. And guess who was called by the prosecution as an expert witness in pre-trials? Dr. Lawrence Pazder and Michelle Smith. And all the children interviewed took the stand after Smith and Pazder. And their stories changed. Now they were parroting what Michelle Smith and Lawrence Pazder wrote in Michelle Remembers. Meaning they had influenced the testimony of the children as well. Judy Johnson, by the way, at this time was committed to a mental hospital. And in 1986, she would die. I also would like to point out she accused her husband of doing the same things that she claimed that the McMartin Preschool did to Billy. In 1986, the charges against Virginia, Peggy Ann, Mary Ann Jackson, and Babette Spittler were dropped leaving Ray and Peggy McMartin Bucky to face charges. Peggy McMartin Bucky was allowed out on bail on a $1 million bond, but Ray had to stay in jail until the outcome of the trial. The first trial began on July 13, 1987. The prosecution presented seven medical experts as witnesses while the defense only presented one. It was during this trial that the CII's testimony and how they handled the interviews with leading questions was put into doubt and mostly thrown out. A man named George Freeman had been a cellmate of Ray's, and he took the stand to say that Ray had confessed in jail. But this was thrown out fast, and George Freeman was proven to have lied under oath but he was never charged with perjury because he had made a deal with the prosecution that he was immune from being charged with that. On January 18, 1990, both Peggy and Ray were found not guilty, but Ray was found not guilty on 52 of 65 counts. There were others that they could not agree to, so he wasn't free yet. Instead, he went back to trial on May 7, 1990, where a hung jury freed him. Prosecutors decided to just drop the case. If I had to guess, it probably had something to do with the fact that $15 million was spent on this one trial. So all in all, they were all innocent. It was just the mad ravings of a mentally ill woman. But look at the time from the initial allegations to the end of the trial, 1984 to 1990. In that time, Ray Bucky was in jail for a crime he didn't commit. It took a long time for this case to go to court to prove the innocence of all involved. But I am not going to end this here. There is one case I'm going to summarize where a man went to prison for a crime he did not commit. Erica and Judy Ingram came forwards with memories of their father essaying them. In the fall of 1988, Paul Ingram, a member of the Pentecostal Church, as well as a sheriff's deputy in East Olympia, Washington, had his life turned upside down. He knew he didn't harm his children, but he was being accused of it. Somewhere along the line, he ended up confessing to doing acts that he didn't do to his daughters. But he went deeper with it claiming that he had been a secret Satanist and that the devil had taken him over. He ended up pleading guilty to this charge, though he did nothing wrong. And he knew it, because as soon as he went in prison to serve 20 years, the fog of delusion lifted, and he realized his mistake. His daughters, on the other hand, still maintained he did things to them. He tried to appeal his sentence, but it was denied. And he spent 20 years in prison, even though he did not commit the crimes he was accused of. I wanted to summarize this one as a palate cleanser, to show that not all of these cases are going to have happy endings. Because this isn't going to be the only time someone falsely accused would go to prison over SRA and the satanic panic.
While this is going to be a three-part series, it is not going to be back to back to back. I have other projects I am working on, but here's what you get to look forward to in the next two parts. A serial killer, Richard Ramirez. The media stoking the fires of panic. More daycare and preschool trials. More adults going to prison for crimes they didn't commit. A conspiracy theory that inspired conspiracies we see today. And more. Along with that is a crossover with another series I do. The West Memphis Three were targeted because of fear of satanic rituals. But that is for the Innocence Project. But all of this will take place after October. Next month, Halloween season is upon us. For one time a year, I put away true crime for some horror. This year is Cryptids, The Jersey Devil, Big Alien Cats, Mothman, The Lake Champlain Monster, and on Halloween, Bigfoot. Till then, 